Welcome to the Growing Vetch in 2019 webinar. My name is Prue Cook. I work with the Birch of Cropping Group and I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulp Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. The purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing vetch growers a snappy overview of what to consider this season to best set you up for success. Before we start the presentations, just some quick housekeeping on the webinar software. I've muted all of your microphones, so if you could please keep yourself on mute so that there's no background noise which distracts the presenters, that would be very much appreciated. We will have a Q&A at the end of today's session, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time. You can do that by hitting the speech bubble. It should be at the bottom of your screen, but it will look a little bit different depending on the device that you're using. But a picture of a speech bubble, if you hit that, a little chat box can pop up and you can submit your questions that way. You can either share them with everyone or if you would like to send them to Birch of Cropping Group, that will be just go to myself and can be anonymous. Now this webinar is being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing or if you're having any technical issues or even if you would like to share this with your clients or colleagues or peers, which would be fantastic, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC website next week, but if you would like an early copy, please email myself. I'll have my contact details at the end of the session and um, I can get you an early version. Now, just to help our presenters, I have two very quick questions that I would like to ask you so that we can get a bit of a gauge at who's online today. So hopefully you should see popping up on your screen Two quick questions, which is just about your experiences with growing vetch, if you're a grower or whether you're an agronomist or someone else. And also, where are you dialing in from today? So where in the southern region you are, or if you're outside the southern region, welcome. Um, and this will just help us plan. So I'll give you a couple of sec uh, seconds to answer those questions for me, please. If you don't see any questions, apologies, Josh. Uh, might depend on the device that you're going in for. If you don't see a poll pop up, uh, you can have an extra long sip on your cup of tea. At this moment, we've got quite a few agronomists who are joining us today, uh, quite a few occasional vetch growers, a few from the miscellaneous category. Welcome to the long-time vetch growers who are just joining in. We've got a couple from the SA and Vic Mallee, a few more from Wimmera and Central Vic, and a couple from Southern Vic and SA, and quite a few outside the GRD Southern region. Thanks for joining us from the lower EP, Josh. All right, I'm gonna close that poll now. Hopefully that gives our presenters, Stuart and Tony, a bit of an idea on who they're pitching their audience to. So let's get stuck into the content for today. I'm going to share the presentation and we're going to hear from Tony Craddock. Um, bear with me one moment. All right. So now, Tony, I'll just unmute yourself. Okay, so Tony Craddock is from Rural Directions and he's an agronomic consultant providing technical and management consulting services across South Australia with a long history of facilitating discussion groups to encourage pulse production. Tony, over to you. Thanks, Prue. Hey, Prue, I'll just get you to put up my presentation there because I think you've got an AgriOz exports, um, uh, exporters presentation there on the screen at the moment. Okay, apologies. I'm sharing a Microsoft PowerPoint one, but that obviously isn't working. My apologies, bear with me one moment.
That's the one. Beautiful. Thanks, Tony. Apologies for that. That's okay. Look, uh, just as a bit of background, I'm a I'm an agronomist, and I'll be tackling the the topic of growing vetch and what we've what to look out for in 2019 from a from a practical perspective. So I provide advice to a lot of farmers on the in the lower north a district of uh, of South Australia, but also I, I venture out onto the Murray Plains and the and into the Southern Mallee. Uh, where again, vetch is, vetch is quite commonly grown. So I'll be taking, a, a, I guess, an advisor's perspective on, on the presentation today. So the things that I want to cover are some of the key learnings that, uh, that I've, I've got from growing vetch in, in 2018, some of the key considerations that I think growers should be on the lookout for for 2019, and just to summarise with my top five of getting, getting things right for a successful vetch crop. So, Pro, can you to move to the next slide, please? Okay, my learnings from 2018. Vetch is a pretty profitable crop if you've got a harvestable crop. So, you know, grain, vetch seed and grain prices have uh, lifted quite, uh, quite remarkably, as, is, as did hay, given the, uh, the shortages and, and dry conditions. Um, the, one of my big learnings has been that the ability to store vetch for several years is an excellent value add. We had a lot of, a lot of vetch that was grown in some very good yields in 2016. Uh, prices were about $350 a tonne back then, and now they're up over $700 a tonne. So the ability for growers to store grain, uh, grain vetch, particularly in the seed side of things, is, is, um, is an excellent value add given the, uh, given the supply and demand uh, characteristics of, of vetch. I think it's one of the more robust and lower risk legumes in tough conditions. We certainly had tough conditions last year with lower than, far lower than average rainfall through a lot of our districts, and it seems to do pretty well on poor soils. Tough years certainly magnify herbicide stresses. I reckon we saw quite a few issues with pre-emergent herbicides. We also saw where there were herbicide residues uh, present in the soil. I think the, the issues were magnified in, the, in the, the, the stressy conditions of last year as well, and that certainly, certainly came through. My other point is frost is a bugger for grain crops. You know, it's, it's really made a mess of, uh, of grain and seed crops. But apart from some bleaching, it, um, you know, vets seem to withstand it pretty well as, and made very good fodder despite the, the bleaching. You'll see in the little inset photo there, that's, that's some frosted vetch that we saw, saw in the Mallee last year. It's pretty well bleached, but, uh, but you know, certainly feed, feed quality was, uh, and fodder quality was very good. Another one of my learnings is that, uh, and it's not my saying, it's one of my clients' sayings, that vetch pods are like chocolate for grubs. Heliophis or native budworm grubs absolutely love vetch pods and they seem to make a real mess of them, moving down the pod, drilling a line of holes, taking out every seed. So, you know, one of my, my learnings has been that, uh, that Heliophis control, if you're looking at producing seed or grain, is going to be pretty important in, in, uh, in growing vetch. And look, I was involved in a trial trial that uh, was run on the Adelaide Plains last year, oh, sorry, the, uh, the Murray Plains last year under very tough conditions. And there was a new variety called Studentia vetch that was, uh, that was involved in that, uh, in that particular trial. And it topped the trial in terms of dry matter yield and grain production under very, very tough conditions. But I'll leave it to Stuart to, to talk about that variety a bit further. But that showed a lot of potential. Next slide, please. Thanks, Prue. Okay, a few of my key considerations for growing vetch in 2019. Watch out for herbicide residues. You've got the normal culprits there, the sulfonylureas and lontral, and I think we're all pretty aware of what they, what they can do if they hang around. And we haven't had the rainfall to, to, uh, to you know, adequately break down a lot of those, those chemicals for this year. Also, be on the lookout for immies, but what I would say is that vetch actually isn't the worst crop in the world for tolerance to IMI residues. I'd, in talking to the new farm guys, they'd rate it as having intermediate tolerance rather than uh, you know, high susceptibility. So it's not the worst one in the world, but if you're substantially below you know, 150 millimetres of rainfall since IMI's went out, we've probably got to be a little bit, little bit careful on it. And just a reminder that over, uh, following summer, summer um, uh, 
weed control, some herbicide applications. We haven't had a lot of rain in a lot of areas. So just be on the lookout for, for phenoxy residues, particularly on some of the poorer soils where things like 2,4-D amine, 2,4-D low volatile ester and dicamba have been used. Most of those, those uh, chemicals require a plant back of, it says between seven and 10 days, depending on, on the rainfall required. But you know, we haven't had, but those plant backs only really kick in after 15 millimetres of rain. And I'd question their appropriateness on low organic matter sands or, or non-wetting type soils. So, so if you put out those herbicides over summer or early autumn, I think uh, be mindful of the plant backs associated with those, those particular products and uh, what they can do to vetch. Next slide, thanks Prue. All right, another message for 2019 uh, uh, vetch growers, and this is probably more geared around, around new growers, is post-emergent broadleaf weed control options are very limited in vetch. And we are primarily relying on, on pre-emergent weed control to, to control broad leaves in, in vetch crops. Yes, there are two, two alternatives post-emergent. That's uh, down the bottom of the slide. Ecopar has been recently registered for broadleaf weed control uh, in vetch. And uh, my comment there is it's, it's, it is very harsh on the vetch. And uh, my advice to clients, if they do have to use it, which uh, is to go on holidays for a few weeks after application because it doesn't, is certainly not pretty. And the other post-emergent um, option is broad strike, but you'll notice on the label that's poppony only, not the not the uh, the common vetch varieties of that we that dominate the uh, the landscape as far as vetch vetch goes. So there are very limited opportunities post-emergent. So that takes us to the the pre-emergent options. You know, trifluralin is is registered, metribuzin is registered, uh, and so is diuron. Um, now the rates, the label rates are listed there. I, uh, for the diuron particularly, I, I rate those, those uh, even the lower end of those rates as being pretty high. And uh, in reality, in a lot of my Mallee sandier soils, we'll, we wouldn't be game to go with those sorts of rates. So, you know, it's important to use pre-emergent weed control for, for broad leaves, but it's, uh, it's also very important to get the, get the rates right for the soil type. And some local knowledge there from local agronomists is going to be pretty important. Next slide, thanks, Prue. So for 2019 vetch growers, I think there's a few tips there for safety with pre-emergent herbicides. One is the correct, getting the product correct and the rate right for the soil type. Watch the active ingredients of some of these products. You know, granular diuron is, is 900 grams per kilo versus the old 500 grams per litre liquids. And uh, it's amazing how people get, get rates mixed, mixed up for, for the wrong active ingredients um, product. I'm a big advocate of sowing deeper with, with vetch. It gives you herbicide safety and uh, 40 to 50 millimetres, I think is a minimum for, for depth of sowing for vetch, just trying to get it away from the herbicides. I'm a big fan of going out IBS or incorporated by sowing and not PSPE or post sowing pre-emergent because it, it uh, provides extra herbicide safety. And then, then the normal things, managing soil throw, Beware about running over paddocks uh, after, after sowing with prickle chains and finger tine harrows because they rake these herbicides back into the, back into the press wheel furrow and cause, can cause damage. And be very careful with dry soils with these products because when you do get the rain, that the herbicides will follow the wetting front down through the soil and there is an increase and increasing the risk of crop damage. And also keep in mind that those of those of you who have disc seeders, be, be very careful with these herbicides in disc seeding systems because it they they increase the risk. Next slide, thanks, Prue. All right, so just a bit of a reminder that, uh, that Ross Ballard and Co have uh, found out that um, that poor nodulation in pulses is more common than you think. And uh, I think the use of Group E uh, inoculum is very good insurance, particularly if you're dealing with hostile soils, particularly the more acidic soils, or paddocks with a low history of vetch 
peas, beans or lentils. So, you know, just a reminder there that seed inoculation, I think, is coming more and more onto the agenda as far as pulses goes, and Vitch is, Vitch is one of those pulses. Next slide. All right, we've come through a very dry season, but I'd urge you not to, vetch growers not to forget about foliar diseases. Um, Botrytis grey mould is, um, you know, if we get anything like a season and big and bulky crops for next year, we've got to th still have Botrytis grey mould um, uh, management on our on our agenda. And you know, the, the key the key I guess herbicide fungicide application time is pre canopy closure. And the, the recommended uh, or registered fungicide is carbendism. So keeping in mind if crops, are, seed crops and hay crops are getting growthy uh, during the, this growing season, and I hope that, hope that we are talking about growthy, growthy uh, vetch crops, that a pre-canopy closure uh, application of carbendism is, uh, is going to be warranted. But what I would say is be mindful of the withholding period. It's 28 days for harvest or cutting for stock feed. So particularly in the cutting for hay type of thing, you've got to be pretty well aware that's, a, that's quite a long, long withholding period to work around. Next slide, thanks. And insect pests, we've got the normal culprits, red-legged earth mite and loosen flea during the establishment phase and, uh, and also cowpea aphids during during winter and early spring. But just a reminder again, these things are like, like chocolate for grubs. So if you're growing seed or grain crops, uh, native budworm can be very damaging. So turning your attention to, to timely control of grubs is going to be pretty important. Next slide, thanks. Okay, just uh, in summary, in summary uh, my five tips for a successful vetch crop. One is matching the variety and seeding rates to the intended end use. And I'll have a talk a little bit about that in a, in a sec with a follow-up slide. When in doubt, inoculate with an appropriate rhizobium strain. Get your bro broadleaf weed control strategy right, which for me is getting choosing the right product at the right rate, the right timing and right place. And keep in mind that there are limited post-emergent options for, for broadleaf weed control. Be proactive in managing foliar disease, particularly uh, Botrytis grey mould in growthy crops and, uh, and manage insects, particularly grubs in uh, seed and grain crops. And I'd just like to explore the uh, point number one just a little bit further before I close. Next slide, thanks Prue. Okay, so first one is, is seeding rates. And uh, you'll see in the, in the uh, VETCH grow notes, which is on the GRDC website, that there are some suggested plant densities for different end uses of VETCH. And you can see that you know, if, you're, if you're planting a grain or seed crop, the, it, the target plant densities are lower than if you were, say, growing, growing uh, a VETCH for hay or grazing. And brown manure, you know, keep, those, keep those rates up because you're looking to, to uh, produce as much bulk as you can. And I'm a big advocate of uh, calculating seeding rates by, by doing, doing some 100 or 1,000 seed weights at this time of year and applying that formula that you can see in the slide. So, yeah, I have a lot of people say, well, what rate shall I be sowing it? My, my response is, let's have a look at the seed size and we'll actually calculate an appropriate rate given your given your intended uh, end use of that veg crop. Next slide, thanks, Prue. And finally, I think it's uh, there's a real knack in matching veg varieties to the end use. Uh, through here, we grow a lot of uh, veg and oats for hay, and it's important to match up your veg variety with, with your hay variety so that you haven't got veg that's, uh, that's you know, fully potted and the, the oats are only just coming out in head. So I'm, um, when I'm using poppony in those higher rainfall areas, I try and match it with, with uh, mulgara or winter rue oats, some later, later uh, oat types. For Morava, I'm a bit of a fan of uh, matching it with Yalara or Wallaroo oats so that we match that, uh, I guess, that, that late flowering of the vetch to, to hopefully uh, flowering time of, uh, of the oats. Uh, I've seen people get this wrong and uh, the oats aren't even out in head and the vetch is already in pod where they, where they don't match varieties. For, for grain and hay in low rainfall areas where you're looking at, at straight vetch, 
you know, Volga and Studencia, the new one uh, which will be available in the future, will be good options. For the medium to high rainfall areas, uh, you know, Timok and Morava still still form a great um, great great choices as far as um, of grain and hay. And also for hay in the high rainfall areas, I'm still a fan of uh, Popany, which has been around for oh since uh, since I was a since, since I was a boy, I'm sure. So yeah, matching matching varieties to end use, I think, is pretty important. So, Prue, that's probably all I wanted to, to run through. I'll hand back over to you and uh, get you to call whether you're taking questions now or, or later from there. Beautiful, Tony. Thank you. And we will take all questions at the end, so please feel free to submit them now. First questions in will get asked first. So remember to look for the speech bubble icon and click on that to have a little pop-up which will enable you to type in a question. Now, our next presenter is Stuart Nagel. Now, Stuart is from the Vetch Breeding Program and is with the South Australian Research and Development Institute. Stuart, I have unmuted you. Over to you. Beautiful. I'll probably um, reinforce a few of the things Tony has said and then just go through a, a bit about the breeding program and where we're heading at the moment. Um, as Tony went through um, talking about residues, they will be very, very important this year. Um, and, and they can affect you badly, so be mindful of what you're, what you're going into. There are a variety of reasons for growing vetch, both direct and indirect. You can produce very good high value fodder and, and uh, grain. Common vetch, can be, the grain can be used for ruminants without a, without a problem. Um, you you're, have the ability to fix large amounts of nitrogen no matter what your uh, end use is going to be, and, and if you're green or brown manuring, it has the ability to improve your organic matter and soil structure. Um, and as Tony mentioned, vetch is very versatile, and you can change then use quite easily during the season, uh, depending on where your season is heading. Um, and, and last year was a very good example of, of having the opportunity to take hay off in September rather than push through because people weren't getting rain and you ended up with a good product anyway. The added benefits you can get are that you can use it to tackle those chemical resistance weeds we're getting more and more problem with, particularly things like um, herbicide resi resistant rye and brome grass. You can either bale them up in a, in a bale and sell them to your neighbour or you can freeze them before they set seed and, and use it as a hay crop or a, a brown manure, breaking that seed bank down. And it doesn't take many years of attacking a ryegrass seed bank in particular to, to really whittle that down. Um, and and grass-free vetch, if you've got a really good grass-free crop, it, it can break down soil-borne diseases like rhizoctonia. It can give you a, a break of a season. Um, we're looking at this year, um, hoping to do some work with Alan McKay on looking at nematodes and how they, they're working with vetch. Um, and it, it's a very good tool to rehabilitate run-down run pad, paddocks. Um, and the other, the great advantage is it's not like a pulse crop. You're not having to go through to seed to make, make your goals. You can um, knock it on the head in September and try and save subsoil, deep subsoil moisture for the following season. Could you go to the next slide, please, Prue? But one thing that you always need to mention is vetch is not vetch. There are three spe different species co commercially grown. The most common is common vetch, um, and that's the varieties um, Tony's talked mostly about. Um, they're soft seeded. The varieties released by this program, Morava, Racina, Volga, and Timok at the moment, are um, rust resistant, which is really important in the disease scheme of things. They are um, better uh, agronomically than the older varieties. And they're, they're a very important step in the production. Then there are woolly pod vetches, which um, are a high rainfall um, crop. They are predominantly controlled by heritage seeds. They, they've had a market for a number of years, um, a little export market for grain, and, and they, they've predominantly controlled that. That is a very good product purely for fodder production. You cannot um, feed the grain to livestock at all. 
it produces a lot more fodder in a high rainfall environment than the common vetches. It's very similar to the purple vetch, the poppanies, um, but it has the older varieties, Capello, Haymaker and Namoy in particular, have a very high seeded hard, very high hard seeded content. Um, Namoy, you're talking about 30% hard seeds at times. And so you have to be very mindful that is a pure grazing or fodder product um, and it will have a comeback in following years. You can be talking three to five years, you'll be still seeing um, emergence of the hard seeds in following crops. So if you're growing a lentil or a chickpea, you yeah, really have to be mindful of, of woolly pods. It, it's a very good, the hay producers in through the Gippsland in Victoria where they like um, feeding the dairies use that product, but they are just solid hay producers year after year. The hard seeds don't worry them. And purple vetch is a different, again, it's a, it's a subspecies and the, it, as Tony said, it's a high rainfall target. It has a couple of benefits. It has some tolerance to waterlogging compared to the others, and it has broad strike in crop use. So that can give you an option in a high rainfall environment. Um, and what Tony was saying about the herbicide issues, um, turbine is now registered in vetch IBS, and and that is quite a good option at times, but yet you do have to follow the label quite strictly. Um, but the IBS and the, the post sowing pre-emergent is, is the vital time. Um, could you go to the next slide, please, Pre. Uh, that is just a breakdown on varieties. Um, I would recommend that if you're looking at, for more details, go to the link on the bottom of the page, the, um, the uh, 2019 crop sowing guide. Um, that has a really detailed breakdown of all varieties. While I'm here, I will talk about Studenitza. Um, that's how it's meant to be pronounced. It's a it's a Eastern European name. Um, we were hoping to call the variety something else, but the name was taken. And all our varieties, um, those that have been around Vetch for a few years, will will remember Rady Matic rather well. All our varieties are named after Eastern, Eastern European rivers to pay uh, respect to where most of our germplasm originally came from when, when Rady started the program. And that's where Morava and Timok and, and even Volga came from. Studenitsa actually means frosty river and it is being commercialised currently through pasture genetics. Um, it won't be available this year. They're, they're getting a certain amount of seed to build up. Hopefully they may have some commercial release next year, we're not sure. It, it will be the shortest season of the vetches. It flowers at approximately 90 days. That's why it's been showing really good results in the in the Malion and um, the upper north um, around areas like Oruru and places like that. It is a the most cold tolerant line we have in, in that it continues to grow through winter really, really well. Most of the vetches, most people see, particularly if you're in a cold environment, they, they'll come up, they emerge quite well, and they grow slowly through June, July, because it it just, it, it's a hard time of year. Studenitz are actually actively grows through that part, and as soon as it starts warming up, it's in front of the other varieties, to the point where probably one of the trials Tony saw, over the last few years, we've been cutting our hay trials a bit earlier to, to see where the fodder production is. And a trial at Oyen last year and a couple in the Mallee the year before at um, Wakery and, and Loxton, we were cutting in mid-August after sowing you know, around the 10th of May, we were, we were cutting in the middle of August. And by that point, students had already had one, over one tonne per hectare dry matter, more than the other vetch varieties. And so if you're after early feed or early bulk for whatever reason, Studenitz will be a really good variety to fill that early feed gap. Um, the consequence of that early growth and, and vigour is that if you get late rains um, in late September, it's already past its peak and it won't make the most of those. Um, the later varieties like Marava and Timok will come on at that point 
and they do end up yielding higher if you have a late rain. But student it's a really gets things going early, gives you cover early, and really um, will be a, a bit of a step change in, in those really low rainfall environments. Um, so next slide, please, Prue. Next, yep. Um, I missed a slide there somewhere. I meant to put something else in there. Um, that's okay. There are a few things I'd like to back up Tony on when, when you're talking about growing vetch, particularly if it's the first time. Paddock selection is really important. Um, you need a knowledge of the weeds you've got and the weeds you'll be chasing, because as Tony said, you've, you've got limited option to get, options to get the broadleafs under control. And your target end use, while we keep saying vetch is very versatile, you need to have a, a basic idea of, of what your end use is going to be. That will dictate your seeding rate, sometimes the chemicals you use. And those first two will dictate which species you, you're going to use. If you're in the high rainfall areas, or species and variety, if you're in the high rainfall areas, you've got the options of Popany and, and um, Capello or RM4. But in the lower rainfall, if you, those really are 450 mil rainfall areas and above. Um, even in lower rainfall areas, the, the longer season varieties of common vetch like Timok and Morava can produce really, really good hay. Um, they will continue to grow and make the most of any moisture you have, but you will concede that you will not get them through to grain. Uh, down around Lamaru, far, certain farmers for years have used um, Morava because they know they will get a really good value hot and large yielding fodder product, but they can see that it's only one in 10 years they'll get grain, so they're buying their grain. So the end use will dictate what variety you want to do. And I can't emphasise enough the pest monitoring Tony talked about. Red-legged earth mite and loosen flea early on will decimate your crop if you don't protect it. And the, the budworm later on will, will do your grain. And the disease monitoring, once again, it depends on your end use goals, how much you're going to monitor the disease. But there's no use ringing a pathologist or, or your agronomist once the canopy's closed and you say, oh, look, I've got botrytis going through, what can I do? You do need to be mindful that in high production years and in high rainfall environments, that disease will come in. And one other thing I will say about disease, there are a lot of people still out there that are concerned about grain prices, so they look to the older varieties like Languedoc, Blanche Fleur and Cummins, particularly um, varieties like Cummins on Air Peninsula. These varieties are highly susceptible to rust. The, the varieties released by this program from when Rady started with Morava, Racina, Volga, Timok and, and Studenitsa are all rust resistant completely. Rust can be a major disease in, in, um, even in low rainfall environments. You can get yield losses, both grain and fodder, of up to 80%. It can decimate a paddock. And the, the other thing to be mindful of is one of the old fashioned techniques of dealing with rust was you just put your sheep in on the paddock and ate it down. Um, but if you put heavily pregnant ewes or cattle in on a, a rust pad, a paddock that is really, really heavily infested with rust, you can induce abortion in those sheep. So it is, it is a really important thing and it's a consideration you don't have to think about, grow rust resistant varieties. Grow the, pay that little bit more, grow Morava or Timok or Volga. Um, it is a real, it, and it eases that, that burden of monitoring. You're only then looking at uh, botrytis mostly. Um, the other thing is, vetch is often referred to as a break crop. It's not really a break in your system. Treat it as a crop. Don't treat it as an old fashioned fallow. The better you treat it, the better results you'll get and, and your end goals will be achieved. Tony's right these days, um, inoculation is, is almost a given. You just need to think about it because usually you're not growing vetch in a paddock that's grown vetch in the last five years. Um, if you've had beans or, or peas through it, it's not so bad, but inoculation, um, Ross Ballard's been showing data at, at recent updates where um, the levels of nodulation have a direct correlation to the, the 
above ground biomass and grain yield. So it's really, really important to do that. Um, and briefly, I'll just also, you can go to the next slide, it's just another picture of showing the differences between the, the species. And briefly, I'll go through where we're going as a program. I'm probably running over time, pretty sorry. Um, we are doing a, a bit more work around acid tolerance and looking to see what we've got. We've got a line that has been yielding very well in the last couple of years in, in sites in uh, New South Wales and Western Australia where the, the pHs are down around between five and four and a half. Um, and that line has been doing well. So we're looking at a, a couple of sites in South Australia this year with with lower pHs. We're also going to be working with Ross Ballard's group on their, their new acid tolerant rhizobia to see the effects that we can produce with that. We are also trying to get a bit of work done with, with Alan McKay, as I mentioned, looking at the nemato different nematodes and how they affect or are hosted or not on a veg crop. Um, and so there is, a, there is that bit of work ongoing. Um, for those that are interested in the future of the breeding program, it's a little bit unclear at the moment um, because GRDC are about to um, put a tender out for veg breeding services and so um, looking to, for more commercial interest. So um, those are our current goals, but as for future releases, that's all a bit up in the air until GRDC work out where, that, where we're going as a program. So just, that's just a brief at the end. Um, and that's about all I've got to say at the moment, Pre. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Stuart. That's fantastic. Um, we'll now move into the Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder, as you can see on your screen where I put a red circle around, that's the button you're looking to hit to be able to type in a question. We've had one question come in so far from Joshua. Um, and the question is, do you get problems with rust on woolly pod vetch? Woolly pod vetch is completely resistant to rust. All varieties. Easy answer. Um, we'll give you a few more minutes to type in some questions, so please feel free to submit something. Um, but while I'm waiting for any additional questions to come in, if you're looking for further information on VETCH, GRDC Grow Notes is a very comprehensive resource, and Tony mentioned this in his presentation, so that's available. The link is there on your screen, or you can just Google GRDC Grow Notes and VETCH. Uh, make sure you get the one for the southern region because there are ones that are regionally specific. Also, um, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project, which this webinar is a part of, is looking to have a number of activities occurring through 2019 to br continue bringing you the latest pulse information. We have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and SA, and the locations of those are on your screen. And their um, discussion groups, Tony facilitates one of those groups based at Manham, and they're about looking at particularly newer pulse growers and bringing them up to speed with what they need to do to successfully grow different pulse crops as relative to their region. Uh, Stuart and Tony, another question in. What's the difference in the various new common vetch varieties? You want me to answer that one, Tony? Yes, go for it, Stuart. Um, when you're saying new, I'm assuming you're talking about Timok, Volga, and probably Um Volga is an early season variety. It flowers between 95 and 105 days, for example. It's very good, as Tony mentioned, um, on the, the Murray Plains. It, its target was low rainfall. Um, it is a very good all-rounder. It produces good amounts of seed and very good hay, but it, it's really targeted probably less than 350 mils. Um, Timok is a bigger plant. Timok was almost seen um, as a replacement for Marab in the medium rainfall, medium to high rainfall areas. It flowers between 105 and 110 days, so it's a little bit later. It puts on a lot more bulk at the end of the season. Its vigour is actually, early vigour and growth is actually better than Volga's and it keeps going through the season. So when you've got 350 plus mils of rainfall, Timok is your, your target and it, it, it fits in a little bit better in mixtures with the oats because it's a bit of a later season, as Tony pointed out. Um, and and it, it does have better high-end production, if you like, with the extra rainfall. 
it outyields Volga in, in those medium to high rainfall areas quite significantly, both grain and hay production. Studenets are the newer variety that, that will be coming, as I, I gave a bit of a brief on, is earlier than all of those put together at flowers at about 90 days. It, it's early bulk and vigour surpasses everything else. It produces that bulk earlier and will feed, fill a feed gap. Um, and it also will give you a better target of timing of, of uh, crop topping ryegrass and things like that. Um, it won't ever compete with Volga and Timok in, a, in higher than, say, 320, 330 mil rainfall. But in those lower rainfall cropping environments, particularly the mixed farming systems, it, it's a really good fit. And, and those three are the newer varieties, and they give you that range of um, choices to fit into your system or your target end use um, if you can get grain. We've had two more questions come in and that'll probably be all that we'll have time for today. The first one that came in is, do you have any comments on nitrogen fixation efficiency of vetch? So what's the best case scenario for a low starting end soil with a pH of around 5.5? Uh, do you have an opinion on that, Tony? Oh, there, there's actually some work that's done. It, it is a very good nitrogen fixer. Uh, end use does determine how much it actually, it, how much is actually contributed to, to the soil. So, obviously, if you if you harvest for grain, there's a, there's a certain amount that will will go into into soil. In there'll be more nitrogen and possi possibly um, uh, almost. Well, just just under double, I think the the, the trial results have said that um, a contribution if it's if it's uh, if it's cut down for cut down for hay, but the highest nitrogen contribution is going to be the green or brown manure, which is almost three times the amount of nitrogen contribution compared to compared to uh, a grain crop. So. The answer is yes. It is very good at nitrogen nitrogen additions, but the end use will will determine actually how much how the quantity of nitrogen that will will go back into the soil. But uh, you know, I'd rate it I'd rate it higher than you certainly higher than your lentils and chickpeas. Maybe not well, depending on the end use, it's, it can be as high as faba beans, depending on depending on whether it's repped or or it's uh, cut for hay or or brown manure. And that, just to add to that, and that um, makes inoculating really important because yep. it's all about nodulation. Um, and it, it is one of the higher fixes uh, up there with favour beans because it's all about that biomass it produces. Um, and those results that Tony was talking about were done by the, the vetch breeding program over a number of years. And, and it, that, that nitrogen is available for, for several years. Um, there is a yield effect and a, in following cereals. A group called the Lamaru Premium Wheat Group, I think they were, back in the 90s, did a series of trials down there looking at um, different rotations. And they went cereal on cereal and they went cereal on veg. Um, and I, I think it was a brown manured veg. Um, but they were seeing a 1% yielding uh, protein increase in a following cereal crop and up to 25% yield increase in that cereal compared to cereal on cereal. So that, that wasn't just nitrogen, but that, that's the, the effect that you're having. Right, our very last question, and it feeds into what you just mentioned, Stuart, but any tips for better inoculation in acidic soils? For example, a double rate plus a long life inoculant like a LOSCA. Tony might be better at some of those. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, little bit simple as far as that, that's concerned. I'm, I've uh, looked at Ross's work, and um, and one of the one of the key messages that's coming through that is is double the rate of peat doubles the it increases the the chance of success a, a lot more. I haven't tended to use many of the many of the granules, but the granules certainly do have a place in in dry sowing situations where where again it's harder to get that uh, that life of inoculum uh, to to uh, to colonise the the roots of roots of um, of of vetch seed of the vetch seedlings. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of if in doubt if it's hostile. Uh, 
double the rate of peace inoculants because there are some very good uh, responses to to that increase in increase in, in dosage rate. And as you're you're intimating, it's a numbers game. It's all about getting the the high numbers of the rhizobia in, in the soil. Um, Ross Ballard's group and um, Ron Yates out of Western Australia are both working on new acid tolerant rhizobia, particularly targeting faba beans, but um, that's why we're looking at this work in Vetch this year. It's a numbers game. I've been told to freeze dried in the granules, the numbers are never as high as peat, so the more you put, the better it is, um, but it comes down to economics. I would recommend, particularly in the soil you're talking about, I would recommend inoculating every time you grow the crop. Um, it comes down to dollars and, and convenience how you do it, but it is numbers. Doubling the rate has a high effect. And if you look up Ross Ballard's paper he presented at, at Wagga Wagga, Chiaudi update this year, he's got some uh, graphs on um, the response to nodulation and yield, and, and it, it's very significant. You need to be doing it. All right, thank you, Stuart and Tony. We'll call it there. Um, Thank you everyone too for the great questions. You certainly uh, chucked a lot more in than the Faber Boone webinar that we ran yesterday. So much appreciated for getting those questions in. Uh, just to finish up on the Pulse Check group, if you're interested in getting involved or finding out any more of them, please touch base with myself and I'll get you in touch with the group coordinator in your local area. We'll also be running some crop walks at Southern Pulse agronomy trial sites right across the region in late winter and spring, so keep an eye out for on social media, GRDC website and everywhere else for those. Um, there's also more Pulse webinars this week. Um, in about 40 minutes there will be a field pea webinar which is happening and then there will also be one on lentils and one on chickpeas this Friday. Um, if you like today's event and format, feel free to suggest other Pulse topics that you'd like covered and we can look at rolling out more of these throughout the year. I had a phone call from a grower who participated in the bean webinar yesterday and he said he'd love to see standalone webinars on topics like inoculation and disease management in season. So um, if that's something that appeals to you, either type in the chat box now or click me an email or give me a buzz afterwards and let me know what else you'd like to learn about. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things you'd like to learn about um, in relation to pulses this year, please drop me a, li a, a line anytime and we'll see what we can organise. There are my contact details on the screen. Again, thank you very much to Tony and Stuart for presenting today. It was fantastic. And thank you very much to all of you for participating, which I am very much appreciated. That's the end of the webinar. I hope you all have a lovely day and I hope you all grow some magnificent veg crops this season. <laughs>